Hi, I'm Larry Cohen, and I represent the National Social Anxiety Center, NSAC. I'm its co-chair and co-founder. And today it's my privilege to have a conversation with a colleague of mine, Dr. Kristen Bianchi, who's a licensed psychologist who practices in the Center for Anxiety and Behavioral Change in Rockville, Maryland, where, which is affiliated with NSAC as our regional clinic in Montgomery County, as well as Northern Virginia. Kristen specializes in treating anxiety, depression, OCD, disorders of body-focused repetitive behavior, such as excoriation disorder and trichotillomania, most recently, she's expanded her scope of practice to include adult autism. Kristen has special interest in reducing shame, guilt, embarrassment, and perfectionism in all of the clients she treats. With humility, she strives to create safe, affirming spaces that facilitate identity formation and, and expression. She's passionate about educating the community on mental health and enjoys giving talks to diverse audiences. In fact, I heard one of her talks a few years back at a conference of the ADAA here in DC, and it was about the role of shame, and that got me interested in having this conversation with her. Hi, Kristen. Hi, good Look, to see you, Larry. It's good to see you. We, we actually are nearby. I'm in DC and you're just across the border in Rockville, Maryland. It's good to see yes. you. I'm joining you from Silver Spring today, actually. I'm at home. And you're across <laughs> a different border, but yeah. so close. Right. Okay. Exactly. Well, t tell us, how did you first get interested in the role of shame in anxiety and depression? Sure. Um, well, I was raised Catholic and went to Catholic school, um, kindergarten through college. So we might say that that primes the pump a little bit <laughs> on, on an exaggerated shame response. Um, but uh, clinically, I I started getting interested in shame, I want to say around seven years ago, when I was seeing it emerge as such a prevalent emotion in patients who were struggling with an anxiety disorder alongside depression. Um, and so I, I just kept seeing it pop up and pop up. And what I was noticing was that the more salient that shame was for these folks, the more difficult it was to get buy-in for treatment. You know, we're also, um, you know, we're looking at lower motivation anyway, if someone's depressed. Um, but I also saw how much they were suffering. And my thinking was that we can't we, we need to do something about this emotional response um, as we also work towards helping them engage in more approach behavior in general. Oh, okay, thank you. And you stress that shame often keeps people stuck in therapy, uh, at least when they experience both anxiety and depression. In what way does shame unaddressed inhibit CBT for social anxiety? So we know that shame is an inhibitory emotion. Um, so when we feel ashamed, our automatic response is to withdraw, to hide, to kind of recoil. Um, so in essence, it, it tends to keep people in hiding a little bit more, which leads to more social isolation and more patterns of entrenched avoidance. Um, it, so, uh, you know, with regard to cognitive behavior therapy, I would say the hardest part has been buy-in um, because when someone is feeling depressed and when they are just drowning in shame, it can be really tough to think about the idea of, you know, expanding what it is that they're doing and risking the possibility that they might feel more shame than they're already feeling. So I'd say that that's where I see it interfering the most, perhaps, in trying to initiate treatment. Okay, thanks. And you discuss what you refer to as the self-conscious emotions, embarrassment, guilt, as well as shame. How do they differ? And is there a healthy component to these? Sure. Um, well, when we, you know, each of these emotions are essentially self-directed assessments that are negative in nature. 
they have a social component um, and there are different attributions that go along with them. Um, so in essence, there, there's something that we experience, you know, as part of self-monitoring, um, but they do differ qualitatively. So what we see with embarrassment is that it's a response that tends to be a, a little lower level in intensity. Um, often it carries some levity. Um, so we kind of think of somebody, you know, slipping on a banana peel, assuming they don't injure themselves um, or splitting their pants. Again, that would be very embarrassing. Um, but, it, you know, it's, these are instances um, that can, that kind of happen in day-to-day -day life that can often be more easily dismissed. So they, they just, they occur on a somewhat lower level, I would say, on average. Um, it, it, with guilt, uh, you know, we will see people experience this emotion in response to an actual or a perceived transgression, right? And when we feel guilty, um, our instinct is to try to make reparations, right? So um, in that regard, it is more of an excitatory emotion. With embarrassment, we can kind of, we have to kind of shrug it off and keep it moving. Um, with guilt, you know, again, the instinct is to make reparations. With shame, um, what we see is that this is a self-directed evaluation in response to transgressions perceived or um, actual um, that involves a, what we call character logical self-blame. So whereas with guilt, you know, the attribution around the self is that, okay, what I did wasn't great. Um, I, I wish I, I wish I hadn't done that. I'm going to apologize. Um, but, but the emphasis is on the action. With shame, we would hear, what I what I did wasn't great and I'm a terrible person or I'm incompetent or I'm unlovable. Um, so it takes it a step further and really directs it inward towards the person. And so for making a character a logical attribution, um, you know, it, we can see how that would be a whole lot harder to dislodge and how, you know, again, it, it would contribute to more avoidance. Now the emotions evolved, they, they did have a purpose, right? So it's not the case that we're gonna get through life without having them. You know, when I think about the, the, the function of embarrassment, um, it, it probably helps us adhere to kind of day-to-day -day codes of conduct, um, you know, perhaps grooming, hygiene, timing, you know, basic rules and regulations. And I think it, you know, we sort of conform to those to, you know, try to avoid embarrassment. Um, with guilt, right, that, if, that emotion evolved as a means to help people repair relationships, um, to, you know, resolve conflict, to, um, you know, uh, yeah, to, to be able to move forward and put, you know, a transgression behind someone and to, you know, continue with social harmony. Um, with shame, what we see is that it has a moral regulation function, right? So the fear of, of doing something that we would consider shameful, it, it, it has its place in preventing egregious transgressions that might be harmful to other people and that also might be, you know, visible and, you know, a, a little bit more socially oriented. Um, but it, it it's one of those responses that gets overactivated. Um, and so while it helped us, you know, again, adhere to moral codes, so as not to get ostracized by our, um, you know, our clan, our tribe, et cetera, in more, pri in more primitive times, um, it, it doesn't need to, we don't need it in, in that same way. Our survival doesn't depend on it. And again, when we're looking at people who are struggling with anxiety disorders, OCD, depression, PTSD, we'll see people getting really, really stuck when that is a big part of their lived experience on a day-to-day -day basis.
It's very interesting. Thank you. I've noticed that many socially anxious people initially experience embarrassment about some faux pas or at least perceived faux pas that they uh, committed, um, whether it's um, saying something they think was stupid or unintentionally, you know, forgetting somebody's name or, you know, unintentionally offending someone, uh, but then go on and the shame quickly evolves, excuse me, the embarrassment quickly evolves into shame. So they don't just feel badly about what happened, but they start feeling badly about themselves and ruminate about it. Yes, um, that that absolutely does happen. Um, and what we're seeing there, as you point out, is that you have the actual instance, you know, the experience that they've had, but then it's the attribution around it, right? So what does this mean about me? Well, um, if I called someone the wrong name, I might have offended them. Geez, I'm such a failure. Gosh, I'm so incompetent. Wow, I'm so unprofessional, right? Versus being able to say, oh, that was that was an accident. I wish I hadn't done that. You know what? I'm going to just reach out and apologize if, if that's even necessary, right? Um, so, uh, but yes, I think so much of it has to do with the attributions that we make around those experiences. Okay, thanks. And you make the point that shame is the most aversive of the self-conscious emotion and the one that leads to greatest avoidance and suffering. Why is that? Um, it, it, shame, in essence, exerts an inhibitory, um, it, it, it contributes, it's, it's an inhibitory emotion, right? So when we feel ashamed, we are less likely to do whatever it was that created shame. Um, and so, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Why is shame more aversive and more likely to lead to avoidance and suffering? Got it, um, right. So it is an inhibitory emotion um, that again, leads to a lot of avoidance, self-isolation, um, and a narrowing of our behavioral repertoire. Um, and so in that regard, we end up becoming um, more disconnected from people, from society, from life. And, you know, in, you know, with that, we can also expect more depression. Um, and so it's, it's, it's painful when we feel like we don't belong and that there's something about us that's unacceptable. Um, so I think it's more insidious than the other two emotions wherein it feels like there's a little more wiggle room to do something about it um, and to stay in the social space in which it happened. I see. Um, you stress that shame plays an especially important role when someone experiences both anxiety and depression together. Um, and socially anxious people do indeed have a much higher incidence of mood disorders, but not every socially anxious person is depressed, although many are, but not everyone. And so I'm wondering, do you see shame as playing a role in social anxiety, even when the person um, has minimal problem with depression? Absolutely. Um, you know, often for those folks, it's a fear of shame. It's a fear of doing something that of which they'll be ashamed later. So it might not be one of the preponderant emotions in their day-to-day -day experiences, but perhaps, you know, perhaps they've had experiences, aversive experiences with shame in the past. And so I see it as a little bit more of a, a feared emotion. Um, versus a lived one that that's kind of part of their clinical presentation. Whereas when it's a lived emotion, it pretty much always accompanies depression, you feel? Uh, some some people might debate that, but I would say so. I, I, I see, you know, I see shame as such a prevalent emotional response among depressed people who who also have anxiety. But you know, even if we just took depression alone, we would see a lot of, of shame. And again, when we're thinking about depression, you know, we're thinking about, uh, you know, core attributions that are, are stable 
and global and permanent, right? Um, and so we can see how um, these this characterological self blame would, you know, ha it has these sort of hardwired ingredients that give rise to, um, you know, to depression. Okay, and I'm curious about body shame or facial shame, what role you see that is playing in social anxiety, apart from those who have body dysmorphic disorder? Sure, I love this question because I really think that telework has done us all in, right? It is not typical for us to be looking at a reflection of ourselves while we're doing our job. Um, it, <laughs> even animals respond somewhat um, negatively to that. They get distracted. Um, and so in many ways, right, it's like, it's like hearing, it's the analog of hearing your voice on a voicemail. <laughs> with that same kind of cringiness, right? Um, and so what I have seen with that is that people, you know, have become increasingly more self-conscious. They might have, you know, they might have started to notice different expressions, different angles, things that they just didn't think about before, um, that we didn't think about before. Um, and so now there's, there's more of an awareness. And I would say that there's more of a self-consciousness. You know, the other pieces that for, two plus years, right? So many of us weren't, weren't moving our bodies in the way that, you know, we typically would in a given work day or, you know, getting out and doing, you know, the kinds of exercise we like to do. We've also, you know, all gotten a little bit older and all of these things, right? Bodies change over time. That just, just is right. Um, but often, you know, I'll see people feeling embarrassed, about their appearance, self-conscious about seeing people whom they haven't seen in a long time. What are they going to think? What if, you know, um, you know, what if, what if, you name it, and someone has probably told me that they, that they fear it with respect to, you know, negative evaluations of appearance. Um, but again, it, this takes a little bit more of a it, it, it's more of a gestalt than what we would see in BDD, where there's this heavily focused, um, it, you know, this fixation on it, you know, what is typically a particular feature or um, some characteristic. Um, and what I see in this is that people are, you know, more aware and self-conscious about their faces, more aware and self-conscious about, you know, the the bodies they live in. Um, Luckily, you know, we can move through this the more we interact with people. You're making me think of the fact that for many socially anxious people, regardless of, of being in person or on uh, Zoom or other, you know, online chat means, uh, one of the anxiety triggers is, one of the anxiety concerns is appearing anxious. People are often anxious that they appear anxious, either because of a specific symptom that is probably true, but in their minds greatly exaggerated, like blushing or sweating or jittery, mm -hmm. um, or just because of a sense of maybe anxiety will mess up my performance. And I'm wondering if being able to observe yourself while you are performing or participating in a discussion or meeting is making people even more aware of and self-critical about how they're coming across. Um, or perhaps if they're seeing it as better than they have thought, but my guess is it's not the latter. <laughs> what, what right. I wish it were. <laughs> <laughs> people would be feeling a lot better now than they um, than they did uh, pre-pandemic. Um, so yes, I mean, in essence, if we are nervous about looking nervous and we're getting this real time feedback of how we look, right? If we see that our, our face has reddened, if we see that, you know, we're a little bit sweaty or our hand is shaking, it's one, we've got this, this active confirmatory bias happening. And then two, like you said, it's, um, it's the intensity of the response and it's how we think other people will be perceiving it. So like you said, it's, you know, when people are a little nervous doing something, I think 
I think, you know, I like to think that, that people are generally good. I think we're, we have compassion. We've all been nervous when we're trying something that's, you know, hard or difficult for us. Um, but, you know, it, people really are, are nervous about, about nervousness. And, and then that can kind of feed into, um, yeah, just increased anxiety and, and avoidance. Um, and it, you know, it, it'll, <laughs> it's funny how quickly avoidance can, can snowball and how narrow our worlds can, can get. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you talk about establishing what you call a shame fingerprint with clients. What would that look like um, with socially anxious persons? Sure. So when, it, when I think about establishing a fingerprint what we what we want to look at is how shame operates and interferes in their lives so in essence we're going to want to know what are a person's shame triggers right um drawn from all realms of their life um what is the physiological response that they have and usually the shame responses it, it, you know it's it's close to fight or flight. And often people will say they feel like they've been doused with cold water, which may have to do with an adrenal response. I'm not quite sure. Um, but we look at their physical sensations. We look at their behaviors, right? So we have the triggers, we have the physical sensations, then we have what they're doing and even more importantly, what they're not doing. Um, so we want to be looking at patterns of avoidance. And then lastly, what what happens when they either take action or they don't take action, particularly when they avoid, right? Um, we'll often see that they'll feel relieved in the short term, but then, you know, a few hours later or a day later, we'll, you know, we'll see people saying, oh, you know, I, I wish I had gone. It sounds like that was, it sounds like people had fun at that get together. Um, so, so basically we're, you know, having clients gather as much information as they can um, functionally. Um, and we take a look at that together. Um, and then we, you know, we use that to develop a hierarchy, um, an approach hierarchy. Okay, thank you. Um, I've come to actually, since listening to your workshop a few years ago, I've come to believe that social anxiety, also called social phobia, of course, is distinctly different than all other specific phobias, not just because the feared object is different. You know, in the case of social anxiety, it's judgment or embarrassment or, you know, rejection, criticism, or ultimately shame, but also because with social anxiety disorder, there's underlying core beliefs about ourselves uh, negative core beliefs that often lead to shame, as you say, whereas with other phobias, it's really beliefs, which I'm not sure I would call core beliefs, but distorted beliefs about the animal or the place being more dangerous sure. than it really is, but not negative beliefs about themselves. And so I'm wondering, what are the core beliefs that you see are um, associated with shame for people with social anxiety? Sure. You know, often the core beliefs are ones that would render a person more likely to get rejected, more likely to get ostracized, more likely to get criticized. So I'll hear often, I'm a failure. That would mean, you know, when I, you know, ask, well, what would that mean? And, you know, we do the downward arrow. Um, what would that mean? I, it would mean I'm a failure. What would that mean? It would mean I'm unlovable. Um, what what would that mean? It, it would mean I'm, I'm unacceptable. Um, you know, so those are a few um, among others. We could say um, stupid, incompetent. Um, uh, I'll have people worry that they're mean spirited or that they are, you know, sort of this nebulous bad person. I'm bad. Um, so those are the ones that I hear most commonly. But I would say failure, lack of lovability, being unlovable and and unacceptable, that that there's something wrong with me that makes it such that that I don't belong here. Uh, one way that I hear that expressed a lot is I'm different and don't fit in. 
which yeah. you know, could be said in a positive way, nonconformist way, but that's not how yeah. they mean it in a way that they're shunned and if, if, right. if they're perceived as different and fundamentally different and fundamentally deficient. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, you know, I think it can be harder to find community when when people have trouble fitting in, right? It, in in part, it it's harder to look for kindred spirits, right? If we're getting rejected, if we're getting negative social feedback, it's really tough to stay in that in those social waters to see if we can connect with other people who who might share some commonalities with us, whatever that might be, you know, whether it's interests, whether it's style of dress, whether it's neurotype, you, you know, there, there can be so many points of connection, um, but, but that fear of rejection, criticism, you know, it's so powerful that, you know, people do get stuck. Yeah, and it seems worsened by the likely use of uh, a likely experience of negativity bias. They, they uh, socially anxious people, actually probably all anxious and depressed people in different ways, um, focus much more on what is perceived as negative in the case of social anxiety, threatening or judging. Um, and so they don't notice the positive interactions or they disqualify them. The person was just being nice. I don't know, know what they're really thinking, that kind of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the positive feedback, you know, flies right under the radar. Um, and there's almost no awareness, it, you know, that it's even happening. Um, and, and so certainly, you know, that we, we see that confirmatory bias operating a lot. Um, and we also see that neutral interactions are interpreted on, uh, you know, through a, a slightly negative um, light for, for folks who have social anxiety. So, uh, you know, I'll have people tell me about what's, what sound generally like neutral interactions um, on, you know, maybe passing by someone and they, they you know, turn to wanted to say, oh, that's a cute dog. And the, you know, the person passes by, doesn't make eye contact, whatever it might be. And again, right, these are fleeting moment to moment interactions in, in which it's entirely possible that the other person didn't hear them. It's entirely possible that the other person had their gaze down because they're looking at their dog and, you know, or that they themselves, you know, maybe they were lost in, in thought, but but often some of those ambiguous um, experiences get interpreted as, you know, confirmation that, you know, that, that people don't like us, that we're not good at what we do, that, you know, we're, we're unlovable, et cetera. Yeah, it reinforces the core beliefs of shame, yeah. Um, how do you suggest designing uh, and conducting exposures for somebody who experiences both uh, social anxiety and shame? Um, so I, I think, you know, more than anything, when shame is predominant, I, I like to think of them a little bit more as approach tasks, right? Um, because we, we're not going to set someone up to do something that is objectively going to bring them shame, right? Like, I'm not going to ask somebody to go into a store and break a law or, you know, shout out something that's mean and, you know, could actually result in a, a negative outcome. But, you know, what we think about are what are some of the everyday social encounters, interactions that that you are avoiding because you feel so ashamed and because you are worried that that shame will um, just increase and be confirmed, you know, by, by other people. Um, and so we really, I, I like to think about it as how do we get you out of hiding, right? Because it, it's shame that that's really keeping you stuck. And, and it is, it's a false alarm. It's not even possible for any human being to, um, you know, to be as completely unacceptable as, as your shame is making you think you are. Um, and so I, you know, talk about uh, 
behavioral approach as a collaborative endeavor, we do have to accept uncertainty around the experience of shame. We don't know for sure, um, but we know that again, we're designing, we're coming up with ideas that, uh, you know, are, are part of a, a person's typical experience. You know, I know with some, um, with other disorders, some of the exposures might get a little extreme, you know, a little kooky. We do some wacky stuff in the OCD world, um, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that with someone who has social anxiety and who's ashamed. And especially if they have gotten, you know, negative feedback from peers, you know, we're, we're going to be working on getting more comfortable, feeling safer in the world um, and feeling like they can, um, you know, uh, building up their sense of self-efficacy and then also hoping for um, pleasant surprises and hoping that they will have experiences that run counter to this idea that they aren't acceptable as they are or that they'll be rejected. Um, so I do it, it you know, to, to, to sum it up, I, I, I do it through a lens of approach collaboratively um, and with the goals of taking everyday social risks that 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 people without social anxiety take. Um, and it's not that, you know, the goal isn't no discomfort because there, you know, there's always going to be some element of that, but for everybody. Um, but it's it's feeling like I can do this and and I can be okay. So the objective of a, an exposure, unlike traditional exposure therapy is not habituation of anxiety when working with someone who experiences shame as well as social anxiety. It's more about learning, would you say, or what would you say? The yes, I, I would say both. Um, you know, so I would never induce shame to try to help someone habituate to feeling ashamed. Uh, that That just seems cruel and uh, you know I, that wouldn't make me feel better um, but but what we can do um, is that we can attenuate the fear response around the expectation of shame so if we're you know so, so we can bring that down right um, and we can also help a person to develop more resilience around uncertainty we we don't know for sure that we won't feel shame, um, but um, we know that that we can get through these experiences, and the more that we do these things, it will get easier. Um, it, it will, um, we will feel more comfortable, and we will feel more confident. We will feel more courageous, um, and. And we may also, again, have some pleasant surprises. Um, we are very likely to have experiences that run counter to what we think will happen. Um, and so I'm so excited when, when somebody, you know, has a experiences a drastic departure from what they were anticipating. You know, they're worried about um, how, you know, people people aren't going to talk. I haven't seen these people in five years. You know, they're going to think this, that, and the other. I probably should just, you know, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep a low profile and they walk in and you know that they're greeted with hugs. It's so good to see you. Oh, I'm so glad you, I'm so glad you're here. And, um, you know, I love it when that happens and they, they wouldn't have had a chance to see how much their presence has a positive impact if they hadn't, you know, taken those risks. So, those are examples of exposures, hopefully leading to learning, you, you know, that mm -hmm. the outcome is, isn't as bad or is more tolerable or in some cases good, um, as well as learning that um, they can be resilient, that they're not as vulnerable or helpless as they think they are, which all helps reduce shame in the longer run. Uh, but you also make the point that within an exposure, shame, you can't expect shame to habituate, unlike anxiety, which 
you know, if they're not using their safety seeking behavior sooner or later, likely will habituate. Why do you think shame doesn't habituate with simple exposure? Um, I, you know, I think in part, it's such, it's such a punishing emotion. It's such an inhibitory emotion that it's, one, it's difficult to have someone stay with, stay in the situation if, you know, if, again, if we were, you know, in, let's say, inducing shame in the way that we would with, with fear or disgust, um, uh, you know, it's the, the primitive response to shame is, is to make oneself smaller and to, hide. Um, and I, you know, I also think that there's this, there are a lot of variables that influence the experience of shame around which, you know, we may not, you know, of which we want to be respectful, right? So there may be religious values, they, there may be cultural variables um, that, you know, that make it such that someone may experience more shame. Um, than others. Um, but, uh, you know, again, we wouldn't be asking a person to overtly transgress. Um, but it's, it's, it's a little stickier, because it is so inhibitory, it is tough to get people to buy into the exposure in the first place. Um, and it's so aversive, right, that, um, you know, the combination of it being aversive and of shame being inhibitory, you know, it's not a not a great mix for a habituation model. Sure, sure. Um, I've noticed that rumination, in fact, there's a lot of, a lot of research on this, that rumination, post-event rumination, but also pre-event rumination or worry is a big part of social anxiety, not all the time, but much of the time. Uh, and a lot of the, at least post-event rumination is shame filled. And I was wondering if you could say more about the role of rumination in shame or maintaining shame and how to minimize that. I, I would go so far as to say that the rumination about the experience it, it may be even worse than the experience or more powerful than the experience itself, right? Because the experience happened once and then it's over. Um, with rumination, we're reliving it over and over again. So we can see where that replaying of experiences would intensify shame over time. Um, and it is really difficult to, you know, just stop our thoughts right if that if it were that easy no one would have social anxiety nobody would be depressed um but particularly when people are socially isolated and ruminating um uh, it's it's just you know um a crucible for uh for depression so you know i guess first we need to raise awareness around the rumination so i think there's a huge place for mindfulness in addressing um, any rumination, but I think particularly with regard to shame, um, you know, I, I like to think of the idea of just doing everything in the spirit of loving kindness towards the self, um, that shame is such a bully. And if you saw someone else, if, you know, pick a loved one and they were struggling with this, would you tell them that they were unlovable, that they were failures, that they just shouldn't show their face in public? Of course not. So we're, at, you know, as we cultivate this curious observer, as we give a thirdness to this shame, um, we want to hold you in that same light. Um, and so, you know, with disengaging from rumination, there's so many ways, you know, once we have greater awareness of it, um, then, you know, we can kind of take our pick what works best, what's available. So if we want to, we always want to bring our attention, you know, back into the present. So whether that's using breathing as a means to ground ourselves, whether that's, um, you know, using our senses to ground ourselves, whether that's choosing some type of body movement that ideally wouldn't necessarily leave us alone with our own thoughts. For, for some people going for a long run or walk is great, um, but for other people, it's just 
they say it's a recipe for disaster and, and that's too much time alone in their head. Um, and then another activity that I, that I love um, for my, my ruminators uh, um, and for myself <laughs> um, is, is mental grounding. So actually giving ourselves something else to think about that is low demand, but concrete, right? So maybe we pick categories and see, you know, can I name 10 of, you know, these different items? I'll go fruits, vegetables, cities I'd like to visit, um, articles of clothing, desserts, but, you know, um, uh, another option if they can't, sometimes people will be so flustered that they can't think of what categories they want to choose. Um, so I might have them, you know, practice going down the alphabet and back up the alphabet, you know, thinking of words that start with the letter um, because it forces, you know, again, it forces us to think about something else. So we are redirecting our attention, um, but it's a, it's a light cognitive load. Um, and, and, um, and it has some levity to it as well. Um, so some people have found that to be helpful when they're out, if they're, you know, in a place where they kind of have to stay still and they're ruminating. Um, and getting in their heads, then I'll have them do something like that. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned inferring thirdness to shame. Say yeah. more what you mean by that strategy. Sure. So it, in the same way that we would talk about fear as a false alarm, and we know that it's, you know, that that button is getting pushed over and over again, that the smoke detector keeps going up um, because the wind is blowing. Um, but there's not actually a fire. And, um, and, and so in the same way that we would with fear and establishing fear as, as, you know, as something that is governing our lives, we do the same thing with shame. And so we start talking about the difference between the person and their shame. Um, so let's see, what is, what's the shame doing today? You know, what, what is it forecasting? What, you know, it, it once we have some rapport or there can be space for levity, um, but what, what's it, what are its predictions? Um, and really recognizing it for the bully that it is, because if you think about, you know, all of the things that shame is telling a person, right? So I'll, you know, I'll ask people, what, well, what is your shame telling you about yourself? Um, you know, they'll give a list and, um, okay, well, well, can you imagine what, what would happen if someone else said those things to you? What would you do if you saw two pe if you saw someone saying those things to somebody else? And usually they're they're a bit shocked, like they can't imagine, you know, they can't they can't imagine talking to someone else like that. They really can't imagine having someone say such vicious things to them, um, and they can't imagine seeing something like that happening and not being deeply upset that a person was was treating another person that way. So there, you know, we, we can say shame is a bully. Um, and, you know, we, we need to make sure that we recognize it as such and that we're not treating it as, you know, that feelings aren't facts, right? And, and because this is getting exaggerated, it's, it's like propaganda, right? It's like a, um, like venomous propaganda. And so there are all kinds of, you know, examples of <laughs> that we can use of bullies, um, you know, can draw on, but it's not not hard to find some in the cultural zeitgeist. Oh yeah, so, and indeed many yeah. socially anxious people have literally been bullied growing up. So yeah, they could certainly relate to that concept. Well, Chris, it's been a really enlightening discussion and a really interesting one. And I thank you for sharing your insights with us. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to see you. Um, and, you know, I'm really glad we could talk about shame. This is really fun. Great. Thank you.